Hello and welcome. You know, isn't education a funny thing? You know, throughout our childhood, we were taught everything that it seemed that we needed in order to build and create and navigate pathways towards you know, a successful life for ourselves. We were taught everything from an academic perspective, that be math, science, history, geography, all of that stuff. But don't know about you, but I do not recall attending a lesson at school that taught me to understand my emotions, where they came from and how to deal with them. If anything, this is just as an important tool for a child to have and to en enable them to navigate through life and its social complexities as any academic one. But the question is, is this a lesson to be taught in school or is this a lesson for a parent to teach? I'd love to know what your thoughts are on this. And today we are thrilled to be joined by Kari Sutton on this very topic. Now, a little bit about our guest. Kari is an expert in fostering children's positive mental, mental health. She has helped over 25,000 children, parents and educators with evidence-based strategies, tools and approaches, as well as common sense tips that help ch uh, children to stop worrying so much and to manage their anxiety. Now, her expertise has made her an in-demand conference speaker, author and consultant wanting to foster children's positive mental health. And she's going to be launching her second book later this year, Raising a Mentally Fit Generation. Welcome back, Kari. Thank you for joining us. How are you? I'm well, Rachel. Great to be back and thank you for inviting me. As always, it's great to chat and I'd love to start by um, sort of understanding, I guess, your um, thoughts on what I was saying before. If you think it's a role of a school teacher and or of a parent to teach children uh, about this, what are your thoughts? I actually think it's for both of us, for, for both sets of people, that it's not one or the other in that when children are experiencing emotions, that's a really key time for either teachers or, or, or parents or carers to actually go, you know what, I can see that you're feeling sad or I can see you're feeling frustrated because often our young children will demonstrate their emotions through their behaviours and they may have done something to somebody else like a, a child's taken a toy from them in the sand pit if it's early childhood in a childcare situation and the, uh, they bop that kid in the nose. And <laughs> we then, it's, it's, a, it's a learning experience or at home where you've got one sibling who's taken something off the other or done something and the other one bites. And, and, and it's that situation where you can say, you know what, I know you're really angry about that, but that behaviour is not accept not appropriate, not acceptable. So I still love you and it is still okay that you're angry or frustrated or upset. And I guess one of the things and why I wrote the article for Kidopedia was because when you and I were growing up and in previous generations, it was obviously said, oh, come on, boys, don't cry now. That's it. Hop, hop along. I, and I'm hoping that that's not what and I know in today's generation we don't hear that as often but still if we're encouraging children to repress emotions that means they don't learn how to deal with them and so whether it be at a school whether it be at home it starts at home I've got to be really honest it starts with parents because children learn how to develop their emotions way before and to understand their emotions way before they actually get to school but as a society, and this isn't a criticism, it's actually just an observation, we don't have a lot of vocabulary around our feelings either. Very true. Well, they do say a parent is a child's first and most influential teacher. So that sort of keeps in line with what you were just saying. Now, mm. we published your art, art article and it's titled Raising Emotionally Intelligent Kids. So for someone who hasn't read the article yet, can you tell us a little bit about the article and just tell us what inspired you to write it? What, I, what inspired me to write it was because I'm working a lot more with families and children who are struggling with and worry and anxiety and fears and, and developing that emotional vocabulary and understanding what emotions they're experiencing. Because if children can't name the emotions, we say that they name it to tame it. Now, I don't mean tame it as in push it down and repress it. I mean tame it as in how do I deal with it? 
And a lot of the, so a lot of the mental health problems that I'm seeing in older children, and then you look at teenagers and things like that, we, there's a research study that's come out in the States. Um, it was taken from, un, it was done in the past two years, so it hasn't been recent, like it's not right now in COVID times, but these people went off to university. And what they said was, you know, I wish my parents had spent more time with me teaching me how to feel and sit with and deal with uncomfortable emotions like loneliness, like um, anxiety, like worry, because when they got there as graduates from high school, they came in, they said, we didn't know what to do. We didn't have the tools and skills mm. and emotional intelligence is what gives us those tools and skills to be able to deal with a wide variety of emotions. Yes. Now, I would love to read um, a little paragraph from the article, which I think some paraphrases and summarizes a lot of what you're just saying. Um, mm -hmm. so this is quoting you. Um, the yeah. primary pathways in the brain that enable us to recognize, understand, and manage our emotions are formed in early childhood. These are substantially impacted by parent-child interactions and children's observations of the way the ways their parents manage their emotions and regulate their behavior so i'd love to know you do you think um you know a parent's role is to create against uh, I, I guess the the balance um of uh, children's emotions in their lives and to teach them this at all uh, yes it is it, it's our we are as you said before we are our children's first primary and most important teachers throughout life if you look at or ask adults where did you learn things or what are the voices and the voices in their heads? And I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but the things we say to ourselves, how we deal with situations, our inner we voice, frequent, our inner voice frequently happens between when we get this, it's between zero and eight because we're sponges. Yes. Mm -hmm. So when we look at this, children are little people don't have, the filters that adults do to say, you know what? Yeah, mum's a bit cranky at the moment. That's why she's that way. And I think if it, when you read the article or when your listeners read the article, they'll see there was a situation where I wasn't particularly proud. We're going to speak of, about that later on in the chat, actually. <laughs> uh, where I wasn't particularly proud of what happened because if we are not regulating our own emotions as adults, that will flare the child as well. So if the child is becoming angry or frustrated or worried and we are escalating with them what that does is just it goes up and up and up it, and and then it's likely most probably to explode in a situation that is not good for anybody and what we need to be able to model and that's why emotional intelligence is incredibly important for us as parents and adults as well is how do we handle our emotions and and I don't mean to draw a, a, a long bow, but <clears throat> when you look at domestic, and I know this isn't, a, but domestic violence, and, and when you look at how do people handle anger, how do people handle, handle rage, these are people, and I'm not excusing their behaviour or justifying it at all, but this is out of control behaviour in a lot of situations. Yes. Not acceptable. And what we have to show is that it's not okay if you are angry, it is never okay to hurt somebody else. It is never okay to do those sorts of things. And that's what we have to teach our children. If you're sad, there are other ways to express it than by harming yourself. Because we have a lot of children who are growing up and there's a lot of self-harm with our teenagers that it, people go, but why do they do it? And it's to take pain away because they don't know any other way. Yes. So it's really important for us as adults to give them those healthy role models. So let's maybe start at the beginning and establish, you know, and could you please explain you know, what is um, emotional intelligence and why is it so important for our kids to develop these skills? Emotional intelligence is our child's, it's our ability, but our child's ability to identify, evaluate, control and express their emotions. So whether it's, it's understanding that, um, and sometimes when I work with little people, it's sometimes, what are you feeling in your body? Or it may be my face gets really hot or my hands get sweaty, or I feel like I've got butterflies in my tummy. And sometimes they, because often, and a lot of the, fa the listeners on your call may have been mums or families, and sometimes they'll say, oh, I'm just, 
I'm bored or uh, I'm this. They don't actually know what they're feeling, but they will label it with something else. So they might label it bored or they might label it this because they don't have the language to say, you know what, I'm really Articulate what it is. Absolutely. And that's why, it, and I know um, if you've ever seen it, the, have you seen um, in the movie Inside, is it Inside Out, where the five emotions, it's a Disney movie and it's got joy, ha- so joy, anger, disappointment, um, sadness and another one. Oh, and jealousy. So there's emotions and what happens is, what they say and what they've given children is the ability to go, when I feel that way, this is what it looks like. So one of the things when you start and why we need children to understand what they're feeling is because there's a, there's a space in between stimulus and response. So when a child gets angry and before they respond, there is a space. And that space, for little children, particularly for 18 month olds, if we were looking at toddlers or we were looking at 18 months to two, two or three years, that space is very short. But what we can teach them and role model for them is when somebody takes a toy off you and you get angry and they will biff them in the face or they will push or shove, we can say, I can see you're really angry. We can do this instead. So we are co-regulating. We're not expecting small children to be able to regulate their emotions. That's not what I'm saying at the moment. Mm. The first thing we do is help them identify it. So Daniel Goleman, um, he's written about emotional intelligence and has has written a huge amount of work about this. And the first one is self-awareness. And what self-awareness is, is this is how I'm feeling. This is how I'm feeling and this is the emotion I'm feeling. And so we can say to children, it might be that they're disgusted by something, but we don't often use the word disgusted. So it would be um, instead of, and they may go, oh, that makes me angry. Well, is it angry? Okay, tell me about that. Tell me what you're feeling. Tell me why it made you angry. And always, again, I'm talking to you in adult language, but we always use age appropriate language with children. So it would be, oh, your face looks angry. Can you tell me what's wrong? What (laughs) happened? And then they tell me that. And then I go, okay, so when somebody does X, Y, Z, that makes you angry. And then, and or when I see their face and I say, you know, or they pick out, um, there's a whole lot of resources where you can have emotions on, fa- on, on different things and they go, that one. Or I, I see your face, your face looks sad or your face looks upset. And what does that mean? What's wrong? And okay, so when these two little people, they didn't let you play their game, that meant you were a bit upset and sad. What can we, and then we problem solve. And how does your body feel when you're upset and sad? And that way they can know this is sad, this is angry, this is fear. And children, children are very in touch with their bodies. They can feel something's going on in their bodies, but they may not be able to articulate it, as you said before. So is EQ and empathy the same thing? Is this empathy we're talking about or is it different again? No, it's different again. So emotional intelligence is, um, is really about, and emotional, so emotionally intelligent people have empathy for others because they can understand and empathy requires you to understand what another person is going through and be able to put yourself in their shoes. But if you actually don't have enough emotional intelligence yourself, you won't be able to do that. So, so, okay. so yeah. Emotional intelligence is when you understand your own emotions and how you're feeling and empathy is having that for other people and understanding it in other people. The ability to do that with other people. Yes. So emotional intelligence is very much around, I'm aware of that. And I can also, so the first one, the first step with emotional intelligence is self-awareness, then it's self-regulation. And what self-regulation means, again, it's uh, that as adults, we self-regulate. Some people may do something to us and we don't just run up and hit them. We might think things in our heads. We might, for example, road rage. And this is often when parents say to me, I now realise that I have to regulate more. When I didn't have kids in the back of the car, I could say mm. the things I was well, thinking. But this is something yeah, I want to keep going. 
I want to talk to you about because there are many parents in this generation who quite never were ever taught EQ and to understand and to regulate their own emotions, exactly what you're just talking about. So all of a sudden they find themselves on the road um, with kids in the back and they're having road rage and they're like, well, I've, I've, you know, understanding that, that, that they can't regulate their own emotions. So then how can we teach our children about something that so many parents have never, m- maybe never fully learnt themselves in the first place? And that's where I often say to parents, look, this is a learning journey for you as well. And a lot of the families I'm working with say, oh, well, I find it so hard. And I say, I'm not saying I'm not perfect. And as you would have read in the article, and we'll talk about that later, I wasn't, there are, and I'm not holding myself up as a perfect example at all. Mm. What I am saying is that we are all on this journey together. We are all learning. And if you want to know more, go and read about Goleman's work, or you can Google about emotional intelligence or things like that to find out some more. Read the article. The article is a starting point. Well, let's go through the article because, so, you know, you've mentioned Dan- yep. Daniel Goleman and he's identified five components of emotional mm-hmm. intelligence. Um, can you just go through them with us now? Yep. You, so you've, met, you've mentioned the first one, which was... So um, self-awareness, yep. the, they know that's where a person knows they're feeling at a particular time, understands that, and, and they then understand, so I'm feeling angry and I know that my anger can, my mood can affect other people. So, and for a child, that's more difficult. So that becomes more of a tween team thing that we're looking at that we understand because young children, so little people are very egocentric. So as long as the part of self-awareness that we're really looking at in early childhood is very much that I am feeling angry or I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling happy. So that's the first part. The second part is self-regulation and the self-regulation is I can control how I respond to my emotions. So I may be angry. (coughs) Pardon me. Oh, good. Have that glass of water. Yes. A lot of talking. (coughs) I may be angry, but it's not okay that I go and kick the cat or I go and hurt somebody. I may be sad, but yelling at somebody because I'm sad and frustrated doesn't help me manage my emotions. So it's actually then knowing instead of acting on impulse and again, children are very little people from zero to, well, from two to about eight, they're still very impulsive, but that's where adults, parents and teachers and educators can guide them and say, you know what, how about I can see you're feeling like this, we can solve it in a different way. So, but that for adults, it's being self-aware, and then understanding and regulating our own emotions. So instead of, for example, in the car rage or in the road rage, instead of them pulling out in front of us and us giving them a gobful while the children are in the back, what we go is, you know what, how do I manage that? I need to, and some of the time, and to be honest, Rach, the families that I've worked with, they said, you know, we didn't realize it was an issue until we heard our children saying and parroting back to us yes. what we said in road rage. And that's when we knew it was a problem. And that's when they came to see me and said, how do we deal with this? And I said to them, you know, we're all on a journey together. You are as well. Like we're all on this journey. Just be aware. How can you regulate your behavior at that time? Because that will then teach your children. I see mom, dad, auntie, uncle regulating their behavior in this way. That's how I can. Yes. So having that self-awareness themselves. So the first yeah. one is, is self-awareness. Then you've got self-regulation. Yep. Self-regulation. Uh, the next and one. And that's. Yeah. yeah it go, go for it. No, I was going to say that's, those are the two critical things for lifelong skills. If you look at anybody who has been successful in business or in a workplace, they have that skill. They know what, they're feeling and they know how to manage it. Now they may manage it in different ways. So there can be people who are very successful, but who are also um, not particularly nice people, like uh, who aren't particularly, who still get angry and yell at people, but they are managing their behavior. They're aware of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So that's the self-regulation that you're talking about. And then the self-regulation, they may not be able to self-regulate, or they are regulating and they're doing it for a reason. 
Mm -hmm. The next one on the list you have is empathy. And we sort of touched on that just a a few minutes ago. Did you Mm -hmm. want to expand on that just a little bit more? It's understanding how other people feel. And that's why it's really important for their own to understand our self-awareness first. We need to understand that. So for example, if a child uh, sees another little person fall off a swing and they know what it's like to fall off a swing, they can have empathy for that. Or if they, so, but they've got to understand what sad is before they can empathize with others. And that's why sometimes some of um, people who find it difficult to empathize with others, or, or you look at different things and you can see that person doesn't, and we often feel it before we can articulate it, but you go, yeah, that person just doesn't get it. (laughs) <laughs> yes that person yeah they they just don't they they're not particularly empathic and th- you can see that that and, and those sorts of people are not particularly successful in teams or in relationships so that's why empathy is so important because life is a team sport yes and we need to be able to identify and our children need to be able to go you know what i understand how that other person's feeling and then act in an empathic way mm-hmm Um, The next one on the list is social skills. Can you maybe expand a little bit on that also, please? Yeah. So social skills are particularly important. And some of the things when we get with that, it's understanding. So it's about self-awareness. And then it's about really understanding how do I go about making friends or how do I go about um, building these things in? And that's what we teach our kids. So whether it's manners, because often people come to me and say, and I know it sounds old fashioned, but it's saying please and thank you. It's saying that's common courtesy. And what manners are, manners are the oil that makes society work well. And it really is just the common courtesy of knowing these are social skills. It's knowing how to talk to somebody. It's knowing that, you know what, I have to wait my turn. And sometimes waiting my turn, I might get a little frustrated with that. Like I might feel a bit angry because I want my turn now, but it's knowing that I need to wait my turn. So it's those sorts of things because when children go to school, they will have to wait their turn. They, other kids may not always want to play with them all the time. Uh, other kids and all of those sorts of things. So how do we deal with those? And those things can make them feel sad, can make them feel angry, disappointed, upset, all of those things. But they need to be able to have those skills to go, this is how I deal with it. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a link through to the article, which of course expands on each of those and speaks about Mm -hmm. them a little bit more, but more about the article. I'd love to read um, and take another sentence again. This is sort of your wording. So quoting you now by teaching our kids how to recognize their feelings, understand where they come from and how to deal with them. We are providing them with some of the most crucial skills for happiness and success throughout their lives. Now, this is a very powerful statement. Is there anything that you would like to expand on this at all? That is my, from my 25 years, 20, actually 28 years now working with families and children, that is one of the most critical things. As I said to you before, people who are highly successful have high levels of EQ. Yes, intelligence is important, but emotional intelligence, because life is a team sport. It is not just about being a an island of isolation. And I think COVID has really brought this about, or brought it, highlighted it. We need to be socially connected. We are actually herd animals. So if you don't have empathy, or if you find it difficult to have empathy, if you don't understand how your uh, your actions, your moods, how you express your emotions, if you don't understand how that impacts other people, you might be very lonely in life. And if that loneliness will then really compound into mental health problems, compound into uh, most probably not succeeding at work as as being as successful at work. Blaming everyone else too. They they tend people like that tend to blame. It's everyone else's fault. It's never their fault. And that's right. They they have not got the self awareness to realize. You know what? It's something I'm doing. 
Yes. And that's the critical part. And this is why laying foundations is so very important in early childhood to get to know because generally we can see and we are very good at reading people's faces a lot of the time. But when, if we're reading them incorrectly, so we don't, if a child looks and goes, oh, that must mean this, and they're completely off base, then their whole behavior following that interpretation is going to be a bit skew with if you know what I mean so if they look at if they looked at your face Rachel and said oh mum's really happy when you are actually quite cross they might continue to do that behavior because they've misinterpreted your emotions they haven't been able to tell what's going on in the social situation and that's why social skills that self-awareness knowing how do they regulate their behavior and their emotions are such vital things. You know, parents are busy, parents are tired. Um, this is another thing you know, that they, I guess, with this, their list of things that they have to get through each day. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm playing devil advocate here at the moment. That's okay. Um, and I could not advocate any more for everything that you're saying that I believe with every ounce of my being that this is absolutely critical um, for everyone and every parent to, to be doing. Um, for all, all the reasons that you've explained, but from that perspective, I mean, how can parents then integrate these lessons into daily life in the, in the chaos that there is the busyness of life as well? Life is busy and we will get to that paragraph that I'm sure you're going to bring up uh, about the first, uh, the first paragraph into my article, but um, Rach, that's the next thing I'm going to speak about. <laughs> it is not about being perfect. This is not about saying and adding a layer of um, an extra thing for families to do. It's actually saying, find the teachable moments, whatever's there, when you see them. Find and the as teachable parents, moments. That's yeah, very powerful. As, as parents, we know that I'm tired and particularly, particularly in lockdown, particularly with COVID, things have been going on. Tensions have risen. I've got families I'm working with that parents are now out of work. All of these things are bubbling up and they they get angry too. And, and sometimes they snap at, at, at their families, their kids. And I say to them, don't be so hard on yourselves. Please, please, please. You are all doing the best you can and just find those teachable moments. When you, when I um, was, wasn't in control, and we'll talk about that in a minute, I apologised and said, look, that wasn't very kind. I didn't use kind words and things like that. When we have those moments where the children, when you can see that, that's the critical. So be aware of your child's emotions. And we all, as parents, we are. Just be aware, then listen and validate their feelings and say, look, I can hear you. Because can you imagine, Rach, if, if one of us came home and said, oh, you know what? I was so bummed. I went for that job. I applied for it. I got the interview. Now I found out I didn't get it. I just feel like crying. And you walk into your significant other, your partner, your husband, whoever, and they go, come on, it'll be all right. You can go for the next one. What would you feel like doing as an adult? <laughs> and often we do that to children. Like they'll come home and say, oh, mum, you know, I, I really tried hard to get on that swim team. I didn't. And I just, it's okay, sweetheart. You can try again next year. It's actually saying, you know, we we do want to encourage our children to be able to get through those events, but sit with them for a little while, validate those feelings okay. and say, you know, it is okay to feel that way. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be disappointed. I would have been disappointed too if I'd put all that effort in. Do you want me to sit with you for a while? And even if it's just one or two minutes where you validate them and you listen to them and really say, you know what, I can hear your pain. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing, tell me if I've heard it right, is to find the teachable moments exactly as you've just given us an example to listen and to validate and to give them your time and, yep. and to em empathize with them. Is that right? Yep. Yes, absolutely. And to help them if they haven't, if they haven't labeled the emotion, say, it sounds like you're feeling this. Have I got that right? Are you feeling disappointed or are you feeling frustrated because then they'll go, oh, no, about the disappointment swimming team. 
that maybe, no, actually I'm really frustrated because I knew I could have done better. So that, and that's then to give way and how we can pr help them problem solve around that. Because if we go in and say, oh, it looks like you're really angry when they're actually frustrated or disappointed, it will, the way we help them problem solve around that, again, that would be on the wrong tangent. So mm -hmm. if we thought it was anger when really it was frustration, the way we help them problem solve would be completely different. So is this where we are teaching them to connect that emotion to the language of, okay, this is, is what you're feeling? Yes. And to say, it looks like I can see on your face and how your body's presenting and what you're telling me, it seems like you're feeling like this. Would that be right? Again, it's like when we walk in and our partners look and go, you look really disappointed. Are you okay? So, and it's that sort of thing where we feel validated, we feel heard and we feel cared for. And those are the things our children need the most. They need to feel validated. They need to feel cared for. They need to feel heard. And then they need us when they're little, particularly to help guide them onto the next steps. Mm, this is gold. This is great. Now, going back to what you were saying before, and, um, and I've been wanting to, to, to mention, which is in the first few paragraphs, you mentioned a situation with your son where he had a meltdown in a shop. And this is uh, an all too common scenario, which, which almost every parent experiences at one time or another. And it can be embarrassing, I guess, A, to have your child losing their nana in and around others, and B, having, you know, you act out out of character trying to bring your child back into line uh, and the situation can leave parents feeling a heap of unhealthy emotions as you mentioned earlier and then following that beating themselves up about it and feeling bad about it so i'd love to know from your like, perspective how can parents start to prevent situations like this from happening um, in in around the home and of course out in public so it was uh, it was school afternoon. We were going um, and the shops were closing and it was getting towards that time. I was in a rush. So I'm, I guess I want to set the scene for people because this happens to everybody and anybody. It can happen to anybody. And, and it really is knowing when you're asking, Rach, how can we do things that um, uh, not stop it from happening, but prevent it? I most probably, if I'd had my time again at that point, I most probably wouldn't have chosen to do that. I had to get things from the shops that afternoon, but it turned into well, looking like World War Three snot and tears and not my snot, his snot, uh, but no, very <laughs> cross and angry. And, 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 and I don't want to look like Mac, Mad Max, as I said in the article, it looked like Mad Max uh, of Thunderdome sort of situation. I don't want to repeat those things in the shops. But what I realised was I was tired, he was tired, he really wanted to look at something. I didn't have time. So there were all these pressures and all these tensions and competing agendas, to be really honest. And what happened was I didn't respond very well. We're going. No, we're not. He said, I want to look at this. And where there was a toing and froing, people were looking. I was embarrassed. Um, so how would I handle that differently? I guess I would have looked and I would have really needed to go now knowing what I know now, and he's now 27, 26, 27. Um, so it's 20 years hindsight. What would I have done differently? I would have gone, do I really need to do that today? Like, is this an incredi incredibly imperative thing I need to get done? Or could I put it off? Because shops are closing. We are both tired. Um, and it most probably will turn out to go a bit pear-shaped. I ended up apologising um, and I realised that it's screaming like a banshee and um, <laughs> getting angry was not the best choice because basically I escalated, he was escalating, I escalated and it just rose up like that and it wasn't a pretty scene for anybody. Um, and, and the thing is how we can avoid that is really going uh, and particularly, and this is what I say to my families I'm working with at the moment, there is a lot of stress. There is a lot of tension. Uh, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of collective around the world collective grief, but also anxiety. Just know that we're being impacted by that. Like all of us are, we are feeling it at the moment. So I say to families, really pick the battles. If you're going to go into something, know what you're going to go into, or um, if at all possible 
don't do certain things at certain times of the day. I, I know, I, I've talked to you before about being hangry. If I'm hangry, which is hungry and angry, bought by the law, like Bunnings, no. That's why Bunnings has, well, it used to, and hopefully they'll bring them back, the sausage <laughs> sizzle outside. That's why, because if Very we're clever. hangry and we're going, yeah, that's right, because hangry doesn't work. And uh, that afternoon with Mitchell, we were both most probably hangry as well. So all of those things combined, really look at as families, don't beat yourself up as parents. Be really honest and go, can I, and look at possibly all the scenarios and get, and then go, do I really need to do this today? Like, do I need to get my, another one? It's going back to school. And this is often what happens. And I, I talk to families and they come and come, one of my families came to see me early this year and went, this is what happened. And I said, okay, Next time when we do that, think about it because there was lots of crowds at the shopping centre, lots of people trying to get school shoes fitted. This little person didn't want to get their school shoes fitted. They didn't like it. Um, they, all of these sorts of things were happening and it then just exploded. Very similar to what I was describing <clears throat> in what happened with Mitchell and I. So it's really understanding what has happened before or what have been the triggers before and not beating yourself up. You know what? We are all human. This can happen to any of us. It does happen to any of us. None of us are perfect. Take it easy on yourself. Don't forget if you have been involved in an incident like that with your child to apologize. I said, Mitchell, I was out of line. I'm so sorry. I used unkind words and that was not okay. I'm really sorry. I know you wanted to look at those toys, but we needed to get this done today. That's why we had to go. And I'm sorry. I will take you back at another time to look at those toys. One of the ways, and I guess, and this has been um, one of the things, and I'll, I had my phone here because I thought we might bring it up. Now, what I do, if I say to families, I would say, you know what? We're making a list for Santa. So, yep, here we go. I'll take a photo of that toy, a photo of that toy, a photo of that toy. Which one do you like best? Look at the phone while I go and do it. So, basically, it's giving them different strategies to use now. Very clever. Instead of getting stuck so now i go if i've well, got grandkids i'd go here which will i'll take a photo of all the toys you look at my phone while we walk together and decide which ones you'd like to put on the list that is a brilliant strategy and thank you for sharing that but you've just mentioned the word right. about getting stuck and I, I want to touch on that for, for just a moment you mentioned in the article people who are mentally fit can label their emotions and manage their reactions without yelling throwing things damaging property all of that sort of stuff um, and they can express a broad range of emotions and they just don't get stuck in any one particular emotion for a great length of time so while they may feel feel, as you mentioned, angry, frustrated, sad, anxious, or scared. These feelings don't really prevent them from having, I guess, a situation where they're out of control and they have um, sort of developed, you know, um, I guess, yeah. Well, I mean, I'd like to know from your perspective, how, how can people ensure that they don't get sort of st stuck and, and, and sort of move, move on from that type of thing? And that, that is a really good question, Rach, because this is, as adults, we need to be able to model for children how we don't get stuck because children will watch us and go, how does mum and dad, and they may, and, and so, for example, with Mitchell and I used to say, yeah, I am angry, I'm, but I'm going to take myself to my bedroom. So I modelled, I'm going to have a time out. Yes. Or I, that we all have different ways. And one of the things for all your listeners, for all the, whether it be educators, families, parents, mums, dads, develop a set of resources for yourself. And I don't mean just um, like books to read or things like this is actually activities. It may be having a long hot bath with a candle and a glass of wine. That may be something that helps you move through feeling grief or feeling sad or feeling frustrated and um, going out and going for a long run works for some people um, eating some chocolate or eating something that um, whatever eating something healthy, whatever it is that works for you, that, you know, this is something I guess that I feel really strongly about because what happens often is we do get, we can get stuck in certain situations, but people who have emotional intelligence and mental fitness, and they know we've got these skills that will help us get out of these situations. So if we're feeling really down all the time, we can 
call a friend. We could go and talk to our mums. We could um, do some baking. Some people bake. Um, we could actually get out and go and look at nature. So these are things that we put into place that actually lift our mood or that help us move through things. It could be that you journal things out, that you write things and write it all down, whatever it is. And you can also talk to your children about that. So what happens is once you've got this strategy, so, and I've, I know I've said to Mitchell before, you know what, I'm going, I'm, one of mine is swimming not particularly pleased at the moment, don't really want to talk about it, I'm going to go for a swim. Come back and I said to him, you know what, Mitch, that helped me clear my head. So I've given him and modelled different strategies throughout his life and throughout my own and I've found them myself. So to clear my head, swimming up and down that black line. That's one of the things I'll do. Going for a walk in nature, spending time with my animals or my pets. I've had dogs all my life, I've had cats. Whatever it is, develop some things that are healthy ways to express emotions. Even if it is, and I say to children sometimes, you know, sometimes you need to rip paper or um, get something out and you can hit a pillow. Whatever it is, you can do that, but that's a healthy way to move through it. Yeah, and I like how you highlight that when we don't manage our emotions and or teach children uh, to manage their emotions, how that they can get stuck. So, and these are, these are great ways to make sure that we don't. Um, but I'd like to know also, you know, do you think that when children can uh, clearly identify and express their emotions, that it helps them to almost like mature a little bit? I mean, still allowing them to be children and to do what kids do, but it's a little bit like childhood, like 2.0, but the upgraded model. <laughs> I don't know. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, no, no, I think so. Um, it's not just about maturity. It's actually that they can negotiate better so they will be able to say things and they'll be able to put forward yeah i'm feeling really unhappy at the moment like i'm feeling really upset about this or i'm i'm feeling this way and children who can do that and can articulate their feelings can manage them better but can also then go you know what i know how to make myself happy and it's generally not by hurting other people so they they have found ways to express themselves and that actually stands them in better stead with their peers. Because you'll see, if you watch any child on a playground or any a group of children on a playground, you'll see different kids at different levels of emotional intelligence. And some will just sit there and bawl. Now, now we're not saying these are all... The, so if we were looking at all kids all the same age, not different ages, because they're developmentally appropriate, little people will sit there and cry. They don't know how to handle their emotions any other way. But if we were looking at five, six and seven-year-olds and you were saying they have a developed a better way of expressing themselves, absolutely. You know what? I feel sad, but I know that I'm going to get a turn on that slide in a minute, so I'm not going to be sad anymore. Or yes. I really wanted to go on that flying fox and I'm cross because he got there first, but I know that I can get to go on the flying fox in a minute. Yes. So that sort of stuff where they don't, they, because again, as I said, and we talked about at the beginning, you name it to tame it. So when you can say, I'm disappointed, I'm sad, I'm cross, I'm frustrated, I'm feeling this, then you can know how to work with it and manage it. And just to highlight again, which we did mention and touch on briefly before, how can parents help kids identify the emotions in the language again? And so again, with that, not be, just be aware of your child. So whether you will know as a parent or as an educator, but you'll know if they come in with their shoulders slumped and they've got to really say, hey, your face looks at the moment, it looks sad. Is, it, is that what you're feeling? What's happened? Yes. Um, give them the words. There's on the web, so there's a whole variety of things on the web. There's an emotions wheel. So you can talk about sad, unhappy, um, grumpy, frustrated. There's a whole range of things. So it doesn't always have to be sad, angry, happy. There could be, you look really grumpy today. Did you get out on the right? And that's, and so all of these things, because sometimes, and, and I've said to people, you know, if I'm grumpy, I know I need to do something else because grumpy doesn't make for a good day. But this is what my grumpy face looks like. I feel, and I feel like this, this is what my body feels like. So when parents help kids, particularly little children, so from maybe two, three, four to eight, 
help them understand what's going on in your body. Sometimes, and this could be about anxiety and worry, and this is a lot of the stuff I do around anxiety and worry. Sometimes it feels like you've got butterflies in your tummy. Sometimes it might be that your hands are really hot and sweaty, or sometimes you might feel sick, or sometimes you might even feel that your, your mind, you're like you're going, all these things going on in your head, that, that means you might be a bit worried about something or you might be anxious. Let's talk about that. Is that how you might be feeling? Is there something you might be worried about or is there something you might be a bit concerned about? So it's interpreting their body signs, reflecting it back to them and saying, is that what you might be feeling? Because then when they go, hey, yeah, that is how I'm feeling, we can help them then say, that may mean that you're anxious or that may mean you're worried or that you're scared about something or that these sorts of things are happening. So it's knowing and going, this is what they look like. This is, it's helping them be self-aware, helping them then know how to manage it. And then when they're aware of that, we can also say if they're out with other friends or if you're even in shopping centers or at the movies or different places, you can talk about movie characters. How do you think they felt? How do you, because then we can look and say, and that's how we can help them develop empathy as well. Or, and you'll see, and if you see a child fall down, that would make them sad, wouldn't it? And you can talk to your child about that. So there's lots of the critical thing. And I come back to it. It's the teachable moment. Yes. Find the teachable moments. And if we are, I guess, to sort of zoom out, as I sometimes say, and, and look into things holistically and look at the bigger mm -hmm. picture of life, how can being mentally fit uh, benefit our children overall in their life, do you think? I guess when I zoom out and mental fitness is a very big concept, it's mental fitness is just like being physically fit. So emotional intelligence is one part of mental fitness. It's actually saying, it's just like we've got strong biceps or where we've got good endurance. Being emotionally intelligent helps us develop the skills that will allow us to have positive mental health for life. So mental fitness is actually about having the tools, the skills and the strategies to actually take care of our mental health and well-being, and have them be, uh, uh, be as habits. Just like we put sunscreen on or sl slap on a hat, slip on some sunscreen, put on a shirt. What we need to do is know we need to be able to, and this goes for adults and children alike, we need to be able to recognise our own feelings. We have to be able to do that to be successful. And we need to also know how to manage those feelings because if we don't manage them in appropriate ways, society is going to manage them for us. If yes. we continually get angry and have outbursts, let me tell you, the police aren't going to be very happy with that. Your employers are not going to be happy with that. So being mentally fit means we've got this set of tools and skills that will actually help us develop positive mental health for life. Yes, and, and enable um, children um, and all of us to be able to have better quality relationships with friends, with families, with the, uh, employers, employees, um, and the whole likes of, of everything, a better quality life overall, would you say? Absolutely. And that's the critical part. And that's why emotional intelligence is the cornerstone of that. Uh, relationships, so social connection is particularly important. As I said, we are a herd animal. We love to be connected with other people. That's, what, that's why COVID has been so hard because we've had to physically distance. And what's happened is we found out the things we value the most in life are our relationships and the people we care about. And emotional intelligence is the bedrock of solid relationships and effective and successful relationships. So that's why it's critically important. Yes, because if, if a child has a bad uh, experience with something, they're, they're going to identify it. I'm, I'm going off on a, a negative tangent just for no, a moment, that's okay. as an example. But if they have uh, a bad example uh, experience in their life, they later going to label that and any similar experience to that, and that's going to have a, a negative sort of roll on effect. But mm. um, on a positive flip side, if they are able to identify what their emotions are in that early stage in their childhood, that's going to stop any negative um, flow and effect um, in the immediate and long-term future, would you say? Mm. Yes. And that's what research has shown time and time again. Early intervention 
is so much more, well, not more important, but so much more effective. If we teach these skills to our children in their early childhood years, it saves money and time and particularly a lot of therapy. Adults, lots of adults are going through therapy because they haven't learned how to deal with really or sit with really difficult emotions, disappointment, anger, um, frustration, because often we've been rescued. Oh, well, make sure everybody gets a prize at the carnival. No, sometimes life is disappointment. You're not always going to win the race. And emotional intelligence is about understanding. You know what? I didn't win, but that's okay because sometimes we are going to be disappointed. And I know that I can handle that disappointment. Whereas now, often when everybody's given a prize or the past the parcel or musical chairs i go to birthday parties with and i used to go with mitchell and think what the hell's going on no we need to teach kids how they de deal with disappointment because disappointment is a part of life mm -hmm. you're not always going to get what you want and emotionally intelligent people understand that and can deal with it so by children learning emotional intel intelligence earlier on in life, they will have a better quality life for themselves and everybody else around them. Um, so there's, there's some re really powerful messages in this. If you were to, I guess, summarize your key messages from this chat today, Kari, what would they be? There are so many teachable moments throughout our days. Please don't feel that this is just an extra burden on top. Emotional intelligence and how we help children deal with our emotions can be done when we recognize them, when we recognize them in ourselves as well, when we're really honest with our kids and say, you know what, and an age appropriate level, you know what, I was feeling really angry then too. And that's why I did that. Not such a good choice or, hey, this is how I handled my anger. So us being role models, we are royal models. There are lots of teachable moments. And just know that when you love your kids, you are doing the best you can. And that's what's most important. Wonderful. And if anyone's got any questions for you, whereabouts can they find you? Uh, my website is really easy to find, just carriesutton.com. There are lots of free resources and different things to download from there. So whenever they want to drop by and there's an email to get in contact with me straight away as well. Perfect. Love this chat today, Kari. Speak soon and take care. Stay safe. Thanks, Rachel. Bye. See ya.